Okay, everyone, welcome to this month's meeting of the National Microsoft Azure Users Group. As you know, we normally meet over at Microsoft, but we've been, because of the pandemic, we've been turning our meetings into virtual meetings. And we probably will continue to, uh, you know, stream and, and record the meetings uh, even after this is all over, because we think we can reach a lot more people this way. Uh, this is our logo and our website. The uh, YouTube channel is new. That's new with this month, actually last month, but we have it now. Uh, and just to, just a reminder that this session is being recorded. I'm obligated to tell you that. Let's go. So a little bit of a little bit about the group. This this is our mission. Uh, we're all about Microsoft Azure. We're all about helping each other advance our careers and advance our uh, our jobs and you know work with working with Microsoft Azure. Uh, all aspects of Azure. We we vary our our presentations from deep dives to high level presentations. We try to mix it up a fair amount. Group logistics, as I said a minute ago, normally we do meet at Microsoft and do networking and food and you know then have a meeting presentation, a main topic. Uh, but we're here, we're here online for the duration, I guess. We have over 1,500 registered members, which still amazes me here in Nashville that there are that many people that are interested in Microsoft Azure. Uh, please tell your friends and coworkers about us. We could always use more members, right? The more members we have, the more potential speakers we have, the more people uh, that are willing to suggest topics that we have. So we'd like to get more members. And on that on that score, tell us what topics you're interested in. If you you know if you're uh, if you have a specific topic that we haven't covered, and you can see the past topics on the on the Meetup group site. Just let us know what you're interested in, and we'll set something up. <clears throat> Excuse me, the board of directors. I'm the uh, I'm the founder and president of the group. I founded this group back in 2013 when there were only four members, so we've come a long way since then. Roger Dolman is a co-founder and uh, vice president of the group. Uh, his day job is that he's a, an enterprise architect with Deloitte up here in Nashville. And Tim Warner is a member of our board. Tim, you probably, if you know anything about Azure, you probably are familiar with, Dim, with Tim uh, because he does a lot of the plural site courses that are offered uh, that, that are available online. So he's a board member. He's also a Microsoft MVP. He's a plural site author. I recently published a book on uh, on Azure. Akila Alred, who's on the call. Akila is our director of academic outreach. Akila works with. Oops, hang on. I got people. Got to invite some people. <clears throat> Akila is our uh, director of academic outreach. Like I say, she works with the universities and colleges in the area recruiting new members for the group and making them aware of our existence. And Matthew Puckett, uh, he's, our, he's our Microsoft sponsor. He's the one that's arranged for us to have all the meeting space at Microsoft that we've been having for the last six, six years plus. So uh, Matthew is a, a friend to the group. And Jack Hagler is our permanent ref uh, refreshment sponsor. Jack is from Vaco, and they've been with us also for the same amount of time. Oops. Hang on. Get some more people in. Okay. And along the, uh, since we mentioned sponsors, we want to do a, a shout out to our sponsors, uh, to Microsoft, who's provided meeting space for the last six, six plus years, for Vaco, who's been our refreshment sponsor for pretty much the same time, uh, and also this time for our board member, Tim Warner, who has provided us with this team subscription so that we could stream and record the meeting. Uh, you can find Tim his, his, on Twitter and on the web as Tech Trainer Tim. Okay. And again, we are starting up, even though we have a permanent meeting space sponsor and we have a permanent refreshment sponsor, we're interested in new sponsors for doing, call it a small sponsorship, where we'll give you a couple of minutes to talk about your group or product in exchange for a raffle prize or something else that we can, you know, we can raffle off to the membership. OK, 
Okay, we've got some. We've got a, a meeting coming up next month, and I can introduce the pre the presenter. I know the presenter very well because the presenter is myself. <laughs> every every year or so, I do a an entry level presentation for the group on Azure. Uh, it's titled uh, "New to Azure," or "Azure: What to Use When." Sometimes I, I vary the uh, you know the subjects, but that's coming. That'll be on May twenty first. And again, just to, again repeating. If you have a topic you're interested in, let us know. So tonight's meeting is uh, really going to be an important one because with the pandemic, a lot of people are working from home, much more so than ever did before. And Windows Virtual Desktop is something that really plays to the need, to that need. Okay, and with that, I'm going to introduce our, our presenter tonight. It's Jerry Lambden, who's a senior consultant at Planet Technologies. And Jerry, I'm going to stop sharing so you can share. Okay? Sounds good. Okay. How's everybody doing? It's very interesting to see Matt Puckett's name as your Microsoft sponsor. I worked with Puckett for several years at HCA when I still worked in yeah, that area. So that's a blast in my past. <clears throat> but uh, so as Bill was saying, this was top is gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, it was released into general availability. Sometime last fall, I think around maybe October, it's something we've been clamoring for from Microsoft for a long time, right? So they've always had traditional RDS services that were available, but they were never quite, they never quite stacked up against Citrix and Horizon and some of the other products. And also, you know, we were also clamoring for something that was Azure based, right? What I want to deploy a lot of some structure on prem if I already had a heavy um investment in azure so when social desktop came along and kind of filled that gap so we're going to walk through it today if you guys have any questions while i'm talking feel free to drop them in the chat and uh, if i see them i will answer them bill if i don't see them please yell at me <laughs> to make sure we do answer them so again as bill is saying a lot of people are getting interested in this now because of our our new reality people working from home a lot of organizations especially smaller organizations who maybe have azure don't have a big investment in work from home technologies and it's a it's an easy jump for them from what they're doing now into windows with desktop it's really easy to set up it's fairly easy to manage um, right now there's a lot that <laughs> there's a lot that uh you have to do with powershell still not a lot you can do with, um, with the GUI right now, I think you're going to see some improvements to that next month. There's going to be releases as a scuttlebutt. So, but we'll jump right into it. I always advise keeping the Windows Virtual Desktop documentation tab open when you're doing this because there's just there's some powers like a management here and also some links to register the application. They're just handy. So, you know, one of your first things you want to do when you're sitting at Windows Virtual Desktop is register both the client and the app with Azure AD. I've already done here in my tenants. So if we pop over to enterprise applications and we take a look for Windows Virtual Desktop, you'll see them there at the bottom. There they are, these guys right here. You have to go through those steps first before they'll show up here. But uh, once you have that set up, you do have to create a service principle to deploy your host pools later on in the process. It is the same kind of process that uh, you probably use a million times to create service principles for other Azure applications. We won't go too deep into that. Uh, just don't do what I do, which is routinely forget to record these values once they get past these variables, because then you end up recreating your service principle and you just feel silly. So something important, uh, you need to do, a, do assign the, the RDS owner role, which allows the service principle to interact with the Azure fabric. So another important step to miss, or not to miss. And once you go through all that, you're actually ready now to provision a host pool with Windows Virtual Desktop. And we'll walk through that and talk about some of the gotchas, uh, you know, some of the decision points that you can make when you're doing this and some things that uh, just to be aware of. So if you create a new resource and you say Windows Virtual Desktop, you're presented with an option to provision a host pool. Which apparently I have my subscription disabled, so we'll do this somewhere else. We'll do it over here instead. So step one is to make sure you don't, you know, disable a subscription in your personal thing and forget about it before you do a demo. <laughs> but if you launch it up here, same same principle. You, know, you suspect your your principal and resource group. Uh, Best practice is to pick a resource group that's going to house all of your virtual machines for Windows Virtual Desktop and you know any other 
um, Azure resources that are going to be applicable for that to keep it all together. It's easy to manage, uh, you know, and also Bill will tell you, I'm sure a lot about Azure governance when you're, you're doing your hostful names and things of that nature. We always recommend that you have a, a naming convention to kind of keep things separate and easy to manage. I'm going to just name it that. Um, one thing we have found, uh, and you probably guys probably already know this, that resources are actually cheaper in ES in, in uh, East US too rather than East US. So being in Nashville, that will be part of the country. You guys will probably pick that region too. It's a little bit cheaper. And then here's the big advantage of Windows Virtual Desktop versus uh, the old RDS is there's actually a new version of Windows 10 called Windows 10 Multi-Session. So this is a different between pooled and personal. If we choose pooled here, which would be what I would recommend to you guys whenever possible, you'll get you know Windows 10 session hosts running multi-session where multiple people can connect to that VM. You know, in the past, you're looking at deploying Windows Server for that and then presenting it with a Windows 10 or Windows 7 in the past desktop experience, right? This time we're actually deploying Windows 10. And if you do need to deploy Windows 7, you can. It is supported. It does not support the pool sessions. You can only do personal sessions. And there's a lot more work that goes into it in the background to make it work. But it is supported if you have any old legacy applications that are still Windows 7 dependent. Uh, and right now, you can specify users here. Uh, one of the weird quirks and gotchas about Windows Virtual Desktop right now is if you have uh, you know an Azure AD group, whether you created it in Azure AD or you let it synchronize up from your on-prem AD, that uh, it doesn't actually support adding those users to the app groups, which we'll cover later on, and actually control access to the different resources you make available. You have to add them by UPN. Um, so that's, again, one of those things that we expect to change maybe as early as next month. What I normally recommend to people is go ahead and set your groups up the way you manage any other application, put your people in there, um, you know, use some PowerShell just to pull people out of those AD groups, add them to the app groups. Actually, I'll show you guys an example of that. Don't try to specify something here. It'll get messy, hard to manage. But, you know, once you get all your all your uh, fills filled out there, you do want to create an availability set because it will scale. It will sit behind a load balancer. Now, you can use the Microsoft math here, which is if you go to the Azure calculator and pull up Windows Virtual, Windows Virtual Desktop, it will give you a similar number. Uh, what I really recommend here is knowing your applications, right? You know, if you have a lot of web-based applications and all you're really presenting to users is a desktop that can authenticate to your on-prem environment, then you know you would go with light and you might even go with custom. And you, know, you can get, if you say, hey, I only have you know, maybe 100 users, I maybe only need 10 virtual machines based on, I usually recommend the D2 SV3 VMs. You know, maybe I only need 10 of those VMs, right? And you know, there is a scaling solution behind it that we'll get into later on, but it's just one of those opportunities to, to not deploy more VMs than you need because we can scale them up and down. Uh, you know, there are cost savings opportunities later on, but you know, just you got to think about every VM you deploy is some amount of Azure spend. So it's really important to know your applications and know the amount of resources that you need based on the number of users that you have to be able to, to deploy them. Uh, and another thing, we'll actually just do one VM right now. We'll go ahead and do one. And we're just going to deploy a B series VM. Uh, it's important to remember the B series are not production ready VMs, they're burstable. So you do want to do at least a D series for your production workload, but when you're just doing a demo, we can definitely do a B series. So for your virtual machine naming prefix, it's this is how it's going. If I had selected say you know two VMs, you know, it tells you the information, but was this is how it's going to name them. So if I say WVD demo, then the name of my VMs are going to be demo one and two. But it is going to add a, a hyphen right here. So if you add a hyphen here, which is intuitive to do so. It'll put you. It'll, it'll double hyphen the names, which is not a big deal. But you know, if you're like me and you have OCD, that would really bother you. <laughs> but you can put you know whatever naming convention you have for you know, your on-prem VMs or your physical workstations, or you know if you created a new standard just for these VMs, you can specify it here. It's pretty straightforward. And then here, <clears throat> the real big thing about Windows Virtual Desktop that I can't stress enough is to use a gallery image whenever you can. Uh, if you have a lot of applications that you want to make available 
and Windows Virtual Desktop for your users, you can select Manage Image. You can't even do blob storage and upload your image there. We don't recommend it. I recommend deploying a Windows 10 multi-session VM into Azure and then you know giving a public IP or using Bastion, logging into it, installing your applications uh, using SysPrep and going back to the old SysPrep days when you used to have to do that to deploy you know your OSD strategies for on-prem physical devices. Uh, a lot of you guys maybe do that today, but it's not quite as clumsy as it used to be, but they're bringing a little bit of that back from an image standpoint. But if you don't have to do that, don't do it. Um, in the gallery, there is two versions of Windows 10 multi-session. There is Office 365 and there's just without Office 65. They have some older versions uh, available. I think it goes back all the way to 1803 if your organization is not yet upgraded or standardized on the newest version of Windows 10. So they offer you some leeway there. Uh, but you know, whatever possible, just go with the gallery image because it's going to be less management for you in the long run. Uh, and also, there are some you know the the reason people will do manage images was to make those image, those applications available. That we talked about a second ago. There is an exciting feature that's coming that will kind of mitigate that. It's called MSIX App Attach. If you're not familiar with MSIX. It's kind of a modern take on uh, using, you know, the old Wise Packager or maybe even Orca. And it's uh, it's built on top or it's kind of the evolution of AppV as well. So you take your application, you package it up and you can use it today. You can deploy it through SCCM or Intune. You can deploy your applications out and they have it, it's more of a containerized approach. You're not actually installing your approach. It's using a player that's part of Windows 10 to actually mount it. And with uh, MSIX app attach, which it's available for Windows Virtual Desktop, what it basically does is mounts a VHD that has the application in it available for your users, right? So the days at that point, the days of having to manage your images will pretty much be over, right? So if you can start pivoting to that now for your normal day-to-day -day application packaging, it'll really help you out once this becomes a uh, a public feature and not something that's just in private preview. So. You can do whatever kind of disk type that you need. We're going to select Windows 10 multi-session without Office for now. We're just going to do a standard SSD to save a little bit of money. So these VMs that are part of Virtual Desktop, they have to be joined to a domain. Uh, they can be joined to Azure, 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 excuse me, Azure Active Directory Domain Services. There we go. Or they can be managed to your on-prem domain. Uh, most customers are going to want it joined to their on-prem domain because they have you know group policy in place they want to apply and you can apply that to these vms the same way you would a physical machine so you know your network drives for your users might be a, a group policy you want to be able to map or things of that nature uh but it has to be joined to one of the two uh and then it goes without saying if you do want to join to your on-prem domain you do need a um, you know, either a VPN tunnel or express route set up between Azure and your data center where your resources reside. That's something most people are already going to have in place, but if not, it is going to be a requirement uh, if you want to join these devices to your on-prem domain. We recommend just from a cost standpoint and performance standpoint that you deploy a couple of um, domain controllers into Azure as well into the same virtual network where you're deploying virtual desktop and also create a site just for those devices, just from performance standpoint, so it's not reaching down across either your VPN tunnel or express route every single time it needs to authenticate. Just, uh, you don't have to do that, right? But it is something we recommend from a performance standpoint. And I'm going to go ahead and I don't know if this account actually has rights to join a domain, so we're going to find out how that goes. Uh, but you will, well, if I can remember my password. So you will need to, to specify a UPN here, right? So if you have a domain account on that you use for you know joining systems to the domain when you're doing something like SS, RCCM OSD, you can use that same account. Let's make sure you're using the UPN for it. Uh, this account needs to be um, not subject to MFA, right? So if you have an MFA policy set up using control access, make sure this account is exempted from that. If it is a pet, does have MFA applied, it will fail. It will not work. And then also, it is, in theory, smart enough to figure out what your domain is based on your UPN. Uh, in practice, that's that's not so much. It often does not work. So I, I definitely recommend you put in the domain that you want to join. And also, if you have specific OU paths that you want for, you know, maybe a specific agency that you support underneath your top level organization, or you have a different OU just for these Windows Central desktops, you know, if you have that requirement you can drop them in here and i'm going to bounce over to 
our Azure Active Directory Domain Services instance and grab what we have set up as the domain. Maybe I am. Here we go. Now, and when you're selecting your virtual network, it's very important to make sure that you're selecting your virtual network. Okay, we don't have any available, so we're going to create a new one here. That's interesting. Uh, it's interesting. To, it's important to make sure you're selecting the virtual network that has access to your express route or your VP and tunnel, right? So you don't expect to put them in the same virtual network, but if you put them in a different virtual network, make sure that there's peering in place so they can do that communication. And it's just there's also a cost involved with peering. So it's depending on what your standard practices already are for how you're managing virtual networks in uh, Azure. Just make sure that you're taking that into account when you're deploying this on your desktop and making the decision about you know how you're going to configure your virtual networks in order to support it. We have a bunch of virtual networks in our lab, but I don't apparently have access to them. So this is a, this is a very much a place where we play around so things work. You know, eighty percent of the way and it's a bill will attest. So. <laughs> That's important to remember. This group here, that's fine. You can leave that the way it is. Uh, for your Windows Virtual Desktop tenant name, this is whatever you've named your tenant when you created your original tenants, which actually we will do here real quick with PowerShell. Right, so when we get to this point here, we've went, we've walked, we talked through how we need to register the application, and then it talks about this. We actually need to create the Windows Virtual Desktop tenant, and they do use the word tenant, which is a bit confusing. It is separate from your Azure tenant. I waited at this point now so we can easily grab the name and drop it in here, but this is a step you would want to take before you got to this point. So earlier today, we ripped all the tenants out of our demo lab, the idea that we were going to redeploy them. So the very first thing that you need to do is load the module, which I'm going to steal from a script that we've been writing here to deploy this in a more automated fashion, which it just pulls out from the gallery. And while it's working on that, this will just allow you to authenticate to RDS, or excuse me, which is the desktop, as you can tell it, they still have the RDS acronym in the PowerShell templates. <clears throat> and when you do that, it will ask you to authenticate. Of course, we have MFA turned on, which means the account. I use the same account to join the domain. Oh, we didn't like that. I used that account to join the domain in my previous step, which means it is going to fail because it does need to be exempted from MFA. We're going to try a different account here. most difficult task of any implementation is typing your password correctly. There we go. They like that much better. And actually, before I forget, I'm going to back up and change this so it doesn't fail on it. Just a different password. No, yeah, well, see, it's also why LastPass is a great tool. All right, so we're back up here, and then here's where we actually go through and create our name. So we've already authenticated in, and when you do this, you're going to need your, you can give it whatever name you want, whatever name works with your standard, does support spaces. You will need your Azure ID, tenant ID, and your subscription ID for the tenant you're going to, excuse me, the subscription you're going to deploy it into. So we're just going to copy this. 
and drop it in here. And we're going to name it Windows Virtual Desktop Demo. This is a friendly name. So when users log in to either the web portal, if they use the client, this is a name they will see. So let's put some thought into that when you're picking it and setting it up here. And then we're going to go grab our Azure Active Directory tenant ID. Drop that in. And then go grab our subscription. Oh, rejected. Which is because most well, likely because we missed a very important step, which is a very important lesson learned when you're deploying this. So you don't run into the same problem that I just did. So there's a couple of roles for using virtual desktop that you want to sign if you're deploying it. And let's see. This is the wrong account. So you want to have this tenant creator account assigned. And it's assigned to one of my users, but not both of my users. So we touched on that briefly, but we didn't go into it in depth. And that is a good example of why we should have went to it a little more in depth. <laughs> you just got to remember, because without this tenant creator role, what we tried to do is going to fail in much the same fashion that we just did, right? And also, this account needs to be a global administrator as well. So those are going to be your two dependencies. So now with that role assigned, we try again. We'll give it a second. If it doesn't work, we may bounce back over to my tenant and do this. Let's see here. Yeah, let's try this again. One more time. Nope, it doesn't like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab this name just so we can go on. I can show you guys how it works. Things are a bit amiss in our demo tenant. So you grab the name you specified here when you created your pool. And then right here, you drop that name in. Uh, then earlier, right, we also created a service principal name. And the service principal here would be what we'd use for this. So we'll go ahead and create a new one just to walk through it. So and it does require that we have the Azure AD module installed, which is not included. with the uh, previous model. I already had it loaded there, so it's good. So you want to be able to connect, and when it connects, it's going to pass connection information to that variable. So the way they have it laid out here in this example is the easiest way to, to make sure the information is passed to those variables and available for you to both notate and also just pull out for the GUI here where we're deploying our host pool. So we can just copy this in. And one thing that uh, you'll notice that if you do this a lot, you know, if you had for people coming here and doing this, maybe they're not sure what the virtual service service principle are. You can end up with a lot of these service principles. OK, 
Come on. Well, I can't remember the right principle or the right command line on top of my head, but you can't look and see. And they will create several of these with the same name, but the object's ID will be different. So just, you know, you ideally don't want to do that as a best practice. You want to make sure that you are creating one service principle, documenting what those credentials are, and that way you have it moving forward. You can grab your password and drop it in. And it will also make sure we're going to do this one, which is the application ID for the principle. Drop that in here, and then also it passes your Azure AD tenant ID to a variable as well. So you don't have to go hunting for that again. It's just available for you. Get extra row characters. There we go. And this might fail validation because of the permission problems we had yeah so it will give you where it has failed right it doesn't like new existing vnet just we won't create the vnet for us so let's go look at that here real fast and create a subnet that should all be good Uh, still doesn't like it. But what it will do, if you, so it's important. This is a good illustration also of why you always have your networking in place, right? When you're coming here and you're trying to set this up on this screen right here, you don't want to be creating a new virtual network and you send that here. It will. It will try as it illustrates for you. I think actually my, my problem is I don't have the right tool or the right permissions to be able to do so with my account. But you want to ideally already have this in place, right? It goes back to what I was talking to earlier about making sure that you can authenticate to your on-prem active directory and all that kind of fun stuff. You know, yet that's a that's a strategy to have it well thought out before you come in here and create your virtual networks. So in theory, this will already exist for you before you get to this point. So I will pop back over to let's see here. Yeah, so we're going to pop in this resource group here. So what's it going to do? It's going to create these VMs. It's going to create a storage count. It's going to create an availability set. It's going to basically create everything you see here, right? It will, you can assign public IP addresses to these devices. It is important to remember that it's not best practice. You do not want to have a public IP address in all your VMs because it poses a, a fairly large security risk because you're exposing to the internet because you also probably have uh, the RDP port 3389 open. So make sure you're removing those if you need to do any kind of management of them or you can use Bastion instead. You know, Microsoft will recommend setting up a public IP if you um, need to log into these systems and do management. And if you build a, a VM that you can use to actually sysprep and then use that as your managed image rather than using a gallery image, you'll probably end up applying a public IP to that. That system, that VM is going to become uh, pretty much useless after you do a capture on it, you don't have to delete it. But you know, if you don't do that capture, maybe do it more than once, just be mindful of that. Just re reduce your attack surface. But this is the infrastructure that it kind of deploys. And you'll see if we had done more than one VM, in this instance, I only did a single VM. So I may have had two at one point. No, I did one. So this would be the only VM that would be available in my um, session or my uh, host pool to be able to show you kind of how this works. So if we look at this and we launch the Windows Virtual Desktop app, this is let me unsubscribe from this so you get the full experience. So when you first open it up, just the way it looks like, and you hit subscribe. you to log in and we're going to do my 
more tenants. Let's see how far I'll let me go with the subscription in the state that it's in. Uh, this is very important. Don't let this happen because you normally do not, right? Because a lot of users are going to be doing this from their personal devices. So this is when you're educating your users about how to access this. There is a web portal you can go through as well. The experience of the client is much better. Make sure they don't accidentally allow management of their personal devices. And I also would set up some rules in the back end to prevent that. So you see here, I have published two instances of WordPad to myself that are available to be launched. And this is kind of the experience you look. If you had a, a full desktop experience available, it would be listed here uh, as kind of a host pool. It would just say the name of the host pool on it. it uh, you can give that a friendly name. So you can say, you know, whatever you want to name it. If, you know, in my case, in my, I have my initial set up as my organization name. So maybe that would you know, be Jelly Desktop or something of that nature. It's just really up to you. You can set a friendly name on it. But that's where you can get. Now, it, if you get into management, and then I will actually connect to this so we can look at that a little bit. Grab the right command here. You get into management of it, that's when you really get into doing a lot of PowerShell. So if I, and there's a, the PowerShell command line reference is available on TechNet and it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty robust documentation. So it's fairly easy to consume. But you know, you start at the top and you look at your tenant, right? So this is a tenant that I have set up here and it has the tenant name, which is a very important piece. And I can say, you know, I have only one host pool set up. Usually the way you'll end up doing host pools is per use case that you might have for yourself or your customers, for example, I want to prevent a full desktop experience for the folks in HR. You know, all their applications may be web based, they may be using something like SAP. So you stop and you think about how many VMs am I going to need for how many users? And then, you know, what kind of resources I'm going to need for those number of users based on just the number of resources they consume with the applications on their, their physical desktops on a daily basis. You know, you use that, you do your math, you figure out how many VMs you need and how many, and which VM series, right? How many vCPUs, things of that nature. And that would be, you know, your one host pool. And if you look at your host pool, You get information here and here is where you can set your friendly names. See, I haven't set it on this one, so it has just uh, the normal name here. Uh, and it has, also it has the load balancer type you can specify for each. You can do breadth or depth. We recommend that you use breadth just for the obvious reasons, right? It's a lot easier to spin up new resources than it is to add resources to existing VMs. Also, you can set up uh, service validation, which is, it has set up here. If I wanted to actually see the session host or the VMs inside this host pool, I to say session host, we can specify this, and then also the host pool name, which I have named with a name I have no idea. If it makes any sense to me now, but it made perfect sense to me at the time, I'm sure. But we can see the session host in here. And if you're troubleshooting this, it's very important to come look at status, right? Mine's unavailable because my subscription's in a weird state right now, right? So you want to say available here. Uh, some of the things you might see is no heartbeat. Um, depending on issues you might have with the agent, there is an agent that gets installed on all these VMs, the Windows Virtual Desktop agent, and also the Windows Virtual, the Windows Virtual Desktop bootloader. And if they're having issues, you might get an error here, like no side-by-side -side listener available, things of that nature. So if you're having users having problems connecting and they're getting resource errors, this is a good place to start, right? You can come and see what the status of these VMs are. Now, when you create a, a full desktop experience, there is a default app group, which is what controls actually access to the different resources in the host pool called uh, desktop desktop application group. We'll get it right here. We can look at all of them. And they will be each app group is assigned to the host pool. So it's 
the kind of hierarchy is tenant host pool and then end of that you have your session hosts and your your uh, app groups and things of that nature so here's the app group that available in here oh well provided that i could type so there's two here right so there is the default one the desktop application group this is going to be your full desktop user group that it created by default right so as we mentioned earlier if you have your users in an active directory group you can use some powershell commands that look very similar to this somewhere right here right so basically we're just connecting to azure ad we're getting that the members of that group by their object id and then just doing a for each loop and adding all of those into this app group right so it's a little bit kludgy right now um, there are some third-party tools um, like nerdio is a good example they give you a gui to do that but in the back end they're doing the same thing and hopefully app groups will support just adding azure, azure directory groups in there instead instead of having doing individual users by upn we can see the groups here uh is in here i have set up an app group is specific just to these applications that you see, right? So when you create this app group, you can say these are the people who are going to be in it. And then also these are the applications that are installed on the virtual machines in the host group, excuse me, in the host pool that I want these app group users to have access to, right? So clearly I've just been messing around with that and selected WordPad, to which this is WordPad are available. And if I launch this, which I'm not sure it's going to work because it's just uh, of where it is, Maybe it will. Yeah, it wouldn't work. Because, yeah, this is actually a UPN mismatch error. But what it'll actually do is log a user into the VM where this is hosted, right? So if you came and you look at our get session host up here, you would see that it was available. You would see that it may, if it's a persistent instead of a pool, it would have an assigned user, which is something to keep in mind. If you have 25 users and you have you know, 25 VMs in your host pool, you add a 26 user. If they are persistent instead of pool, it does assign a user to an individual VM to make sure that that user gets that VM every time. So something else just to, to keep in mind that will happen. But you can also see your user hosts. Let's see here. That's right here. I do. Yeah, here you also see your different. Actually, there is a way to, and then you can see the irritation of why people want a GUI behind this. So you get to sit here to remember what all of your command lists are, right? So you can do a user session. That is the name of that that command list to see who is logged on. So if we say hostful name, That's all the information it requires. Yeah, see, so I don't have anything open right now, so we didn't get any return. If I had this open, you would see that I was logged in. It would say what VM I was using to consume this resource, even though it's just an application. And also you can remove user sessions, I'm pretty sure, with this command here. No. There is a command that you can use to actually get people off. Uh, it's look up the mail up and see what it is. So if you have a user who's been inactive for a very long time and you don't have anything in place to remove it from a scaling standpoint, which we'll get to in a minute, you can go through and remove users manually. So again, it's you have to use PowerShell and it is a bit kludgy to get it done, but you you can't do things of that nature. You can actually deploy all this as well, right? So if you wanted to do a new host pool and you wanted to do it here through PowerShell rather than using the GUI. You could do that, right? So I give it the tenant name. We want to actually execute this. And then give it a host pool name. And you can do it here, right? Once you've done this, you could create virtual machines that are uh, just do the normal GUI that you would use to normally deploy a virtual machine. You can just pick the right OS here. And if you were also, if you were creating a template, for a managed image, it would be much the same way. Uh, it is important when you're going and looking at, come on, when you're looking at it here, if you search for Windows 10 Enterprise, the search is not real good. It's actually not going to give you anything in a, in a reasonable manner anyway, right? It's still is pro first. 
If you do have persistent VMs, it's important to note that Pro is not supported. You must support, you must deploy enterprise, right? So if you scroll down, you can find multi-session, right? So here's 1909, 1903, and 1809. It's like the last version, which makes sense because that's the last branch version of those tandem support at the top of my head. But you can select these here. You can deploy these VMs normally. And you would do this uh, if you were trying to do a scripted approach, right? If you need to deploy, you know, hundreds of thousand VMs at a time, and you want to do it in parallel, you could do it this way and then deploy the Windows Virtual Desktop agent to them after the fact. And the way you would join them to the host pool is by generating a token that is required with some PowerShell commands right here. Right, this will basically export the registration info to a token for that host pool. And then when you install the client on them, you would need to register, you would need to specify that information. So it's important when you do this to understand these, these tokens are not available forever, right? So if you were doing this through a tool like SECM and you're specifying in your commands that, hey, this is the token you're going to need to join the host pool, that's not going to be something you can manage long term because those tokens will expire. And you have to update your, your SECM command to be able to do that. So. A lot of people do go this route. Um, there are some scripts that some folks at Microsoft have released to the Azure Galley that will deploy a lot of these VMs at a time. Those are usually only helpful if you want to do persistent, if you need to deploy, you know, hundreds of thousands or thousands of persistent VMs at a time and then also destroy them. Some people like to go that route. They'll spin them up at the beginning of the week or the beginning of the day and destroy them at the end, right? It's much easier just, of course, to power those down. But it is something that some organizations do, and there are some automation tools out there for you already that can do that from a simple manner. So we didn't get to actually deploy anything, but all we really missed was just a screen where we were watching paint dry. So it got us to the same, we got us to the same point we already saw. So we didn't miss a whole lot. Um, the other two really cool things about Windows Virtual Desktop, one is FS Logics. FS Logics, if you guys are not familiar, is a organization that Microsoft bought recently don't quite remember where it is but it um when it was done but it has a really cool feature be if uh basically managing your roaming profiles from your old roaming profile days right so it supports hosting your the user profiles in a couple of different ways it, you can set up a file share on a server in azure and that's what we recommend and the reason you recommend that approach is because the other approach, Azure Files, does not support authenticating to a on-prem domain. So if you're using Azure Active Directory domain services, Azure Files is easier. You can go down that road, but it, most people are not going to be in that scenario, right? They're going to be in this scenario here. So you spin up a VM, you put up a file share on it, make sure there's enough room in your file share. I'd recommend, you know, even for smaller organizations starting in a terabyte and scrolling up from there. And then you can just use some group policy, which it has referenced here in the FS Logic documentation to deploy out to your VMs. It basically enables it. And then it tells you, tells uh, the computers where the object, excuse me, where to look for the profiles, you know, wherever your file share happens to be. And it does go through uh, and describe how you can use NetApp files. If you want to do that, there's a little more cost associated with NetApp files. And then it does briefly touch here on Azure files if you have. Azure A ADDS set up, which most organizations probably are not going to have, right? Uh, the other thing is scaling a host. Now, this tool is cool. Uh, if you're a PowerShell guy like me and you start going through these two PowerShell scripts, which I have saved here somewhere, and I'll show you guys. Uh, that somebody at Microsoft wrote, it makes you will make you very irritated because they did. It's a they do they work right, but just the uh, the file process that was put into it, you can tell it was something. Oh, we gotta get this out here quickly and get it done. So it's it's something that I would expect to improve, right? So there's two. There's a script to create your Azure Automation account because the scaling does use Azure Automation, which means you have to have an account set up for that. And this script will do it for you in this document here. Here, we'll walk you through that, right? It'll even show you how to download it. Uh, this is to create the at Logic app, right? So it'll walk you through downloading it and everything you need to do to be able to, to specify the parameters. And all that parameters you have specified in the script to create the account, just to name. 
So it will create the account for you. You want to dump it into the same resource group where you have all your Windows Virtual Desktop resources already deployed just for ease of management. And then it will actually, it will also create the run book for you at this time when you run this script. So it'll pull that run book down. And in order to execute that run book, you want to set up a logic app. And the logic app is the script that will really irritate you because the way they have it set up is to ask you for every single thing that you would like to specify, which not the best. <laughs> so it's important to read to this doc when you do it the first couple of times. Um, you got to make sure you capture certain things and you create your account like the webhook URI. That's going to be important. Uh, you have to create a run as account. Uh, one thing that really can strip you up if you've not used a run as account before is it will give you a display name for that run as account for your room for your um, Azure Automation account. That's not what it's looking for. It's actually looking for just uh, the name, not the display name. If you dip a display name in, it will fail. It asks you know your standard questions of your Azure AD tenant inscription ID, things it needs, uh, your tenant name, the host pool. So you, if you have multiple host pools, you would set up a logic app to execute your run book per host pool, right? And the reason for that is you may have different, different criteria. But the real things you can really specify in here is you can specify how often your run book runs and you know what your peak time is. So your peak time is used to, to make sure it's not powering off VMs during peak time. So if your peak time is you know six to six, is not going to power off VMs during that time to not make sure it doesn't cause a, a easier impacts or a performance problem. <clears throat> you do need to specify the, your time difference from UTC to make sure that Azure understands that what time it actually is, where your users are located. Uh, this here, this variable here, the session threshold per CPU basically just says how many sessions per vCPU per session host or per virtual machine before I have to look to turn on another VM, right? So it's not going to create a new VM, a net new VM, but it will power on an existing VM that's in the host pool that's maybe been deallocated because, you know, outside of peak times, it's not currently being used. Uh, it will keep specify how many session hosts you can have running at a certain time or the minimum number, excuse me. So if, if you're in the middle of the night, right, you're going to have much lower demands. And for that, we recommend this, this to one. So you've always got one VM running that's serving your host pool. So, you know, if you're offering a service up to say a, a good example of this is like a local county, right? So maybe you're now one folks need to do something specific in the middle of the night and they're going to use virtual desktop or the fire department, or if you have, you know, healthy human services, things of that nature. If you always has one VM running in every host pool, you, you know that you're always having this available to your users. And you can set it up to log users off after a certain amount of time, right? We're used to this to 10 to 15 minutes after an active session. So if they're, you know, past peak time, and they're not, and they're so they'll do this during peak time. But if they're past peak time and they've been inactive for whatever you set this to, it will kick the users off, and then it will you will give them a message here, right? You specify the title and the body of that message. But after that, it will turn off those VMs after it disconnects the Allo users. Uh, location is just the region that you have deployed in, so either East US two or East US, probably for most of us, maybe Central. Uh, this is just your account name. Uh, maintenance tags are very important because maintenance tags is how it determines what VM to always leave on when it's powering down VMs. So you make sure you have your your assets always available. But uh, that's pretty much what the, the you'll do. Just, you know, keep in mind, some people have the expectation that it is going to spit up new VMs during the day if, if demand is high, right? But it will not do that. So you got to really keep in mind, it goes back to the, they have guidance to know your applications, right? And know what kind of resources they're going to consume <clears throat> because you want to make sure you have enough, enough resources available during the day. Now, there are again, third-party tools that have some scaling engines in place that will spit up new VMs for you based on the image that you specify, whether it be a custom image or a gallery image, but those are, there are probably tools that uh, added costs, right, and added manageability. But if it's something you're interested in, you can do that with um, Azure Automation. But if you don't have time and the skill set to be able to develop that solution based on what Microsoft's provided you, you may look at one of those third-party tools. So that's what the automation can and can do. It's it's mostly a cost-saving mechanism, right, to make sure your VMs get spun off or uh, shut down at night to make sure they're not just sitting around and, and burning hours and burning cycles and costing you Azure spend. Uh, and they do have an article here about MSIX app attached that we talked about earlier today. 
again, they'll be on a keep on your radar. It's going to be helpful for deploying applications across your organizations, and it's just going to be really easy once this becomes available for Windows, Windows, Windows Virtual Desktop to be able to manage the VMs inside the solution. Uh, there is also something cool. I don't know if it touches on it here, uh, but there is also something cool coming with Teams called AV Redirect, which basically takes, you know, historically, regardless of your VDI solution, whether it be Citrix or RDS or Horizon, you know, soft phones have not worked real well, right? And Teams is subject to that same problem. So basically what they've done with Teams AV Redirect is they've taken all the processing off the VMs, right? It happens locally on your computer where you've connected to your VM and it happens in Azure. Uh, that's something else much like MSIX Appetach that is available in, I think it's, it may be in, um, it may be in preview, but available, not in private preview. It's in one of the two, right? It's not something that's quite ready for prime time, not something that's in Glee, um, general release yet, but it is something, a general availability, but it is something that is coming that will really help resolve that problem, which has been one of the you know major roadblockers to people adopting VDI in the past at a large scale, you know, that and cost is the other usually the two big drivers for that. Uh, and one other point here I'll make real fast before we start asking questions or QA is actually two things before we get to QA is you do need licenses for this. Now, if you go and you look, you don't need additional licenses based on what you already have for your users, right? So the only additional spend is just going to be your VM compute time. But your license do need your senior users do need to be licensed for one of these licenses here, right? Which you're probably already going to have if you're an Office 365 shop. Um, if you have a G3 or a G5, it does not list it here, but we have gotten some guidance from Microsoft that, <coughs> oh, excuse me, that those will also work. Um, right now, Windows Virtual Desktop is not available in GCC High, but it is available in GCC. And the reason for that is. Just the GCC and Office or a Dynamics or a, a Office 65 tenant in GCC still sits on top of commercial Azure AD and also your compute space is going to be in commercial Azure, or commercial compute Azure. So for that reason, GCC works. So if you have GCC licenses assigned in that scenario, you'll be okay. Uh, and the reason these licenses are required is just to activate the OS. There's a new mechanism called Azure AD authentication that the virtual machine, these virtual desktop VMs will use. It's only used here. And without that in place, it'll work for 90 days if you don't have any licenses assigned to your users. And after that, you'll we'll start getting your, your nag messages that you would expect to get in the old days when you were just using KMS servers, right? Uh, and KMS servers are not supported for this solution. So even if you have your VPN tunnel or your express route tunnel in place and you're trying to, to activate it with KMS with Mac keys, it's not going to work. It's not a support solution. So the other thing real fast that I want to touch on is just MFA. Uh, they have an article here, but it's, again, it really comes down to, again, making sure you have the licenses in place for it. It's the same way you set up MFA for any other cloud tool from Microsoft, just set up your conditional access policy that controls it for Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, again, that account that you're going to use, which is actually good that we still have this open. So this account here that you're going to use to join devices to the domain during the, your deployment of your host pools, your VMs and your host pools, just make sure again that account is exempted from MFA because if it's not, it will cause it to fail. So those are the, that's a lot of information. I know I talked for a long time. Those are the highlights. I didn't see any messages pop up, but I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention. So does anybody have any, any questions about managing Windows Switcher desktop or maybe use cases or where they could use it or just questions at all? Yeah, anyone who has a question, just unmute yourself. yourself. Wow, not not a not a talkative bunch, Bill. Hey, this is uh, John. I don't. Uh, do you mind if I ask a question? Sure, John. Go ahead. Yeah. So, in typical environments, um, especially environments where you want to control user access to sensitive information, um, in the past, people created jump boxes or a team of uh, virtual servers for 
uh, developers or anybody else to connect to the environment and to prevent data from uh, being exfiltrated. So right. would this be a good alternative solution than actually standing up a, a terminal services farm, a remote desktop services farm, whereas you know, you've got multiple uh, multiple people can log into a single VM. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on top of that, you've got the OS uh, that they're familiar with versus uh, Windows Server. Yeah, I would, Rick, I would say the yes. The answer to your question is yes, for the reasons you just outlined, right? It's going to be a lot easier for you to manage, and they're still going to have all the resources that they need to get where they need to go, right? I, there would be some network configuration, it sounds like, that we need to make sure was in place. Uh, just to make sure they can access whatever kind of resources they were getting to, you know, if they were on a you know a secure network or something of that nature. So you know, it's something just to keep in mind from an Azure networking standpoint. But broadly, yes, you know, you, rather than having to spin up a terminal service farm, whether you did it in on-prem in your data center or if you did it in Azure, it's going to be a lot easier to spin up some Windows 10 multi-session VMs and tell your users that hey, you know, go here instead, go through the, the GUI. Oh, excuse me, the, the web interface or through the app, and then you can get anywhere you need to go. And it's just a lot less work for you guys on the back end to manage that solution for them. And I just have two two other quick follow-up questions. Um, one is, does this work with Bastion? It does work with Bastion. So that's so my background is more with uh, you know endpoint management, CM into that kind of fun stuff. And this is a natural kind of segue into that. Uh, it does work with Bastion, but I couldn't tell you how to set it up. <laughs> that would be a question probably for Bill but it is supported. Okay, and then the the other question was, you know, with Windows Server, for example, I don't believe like Xbox Live and some of those other features that come with Windows 10 is installed by default. Are some of those desktop um, items that you wouldn't want in your server environment installed? And if so, um, what are some ways that you can automate removing those items? So with Windows 10 multi-session, they don't, they're not installed by default. Because Microsoft okay. had the, the forward thinking to kind of remove those. Now, if you have the use case to use a persistent VM and you use an image that you developed on-prem, which my experience with that is that it works okay. That we've run through some issues with some applications, usually security applications that get banked into those images and getting them to deploy, you know, it's supposed to deploy those images. Uh, if you're not doing it, you know, if you're doing it through group policy or you're doing it through, you know, MDT or SCCM or whatever your OSC solution is, those those apps are going to show up, right? When they get the group policy, if you're deploying it that way, you can turn them off that way. Um, there's a PowerShell script that you can use. The community has developed. The only thing about that PowerShell script is that every time there's a new branch version of Windows, you are reliant upon the gentleman an MVP. I forget who it is, but one of the um, Intune MVPs wrote it to go in and update it for the new branch version of Windows. Right now, these devices do not support being managed with Intune if you're an Intune shop, but once, and that's, that's a hard stop for your Windows 10 multi-session VMs, for your Windows 10 Enterprise VMs, and a persistent kind of endeavor. It's one of those, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink things. It's not supported, but you can do it. Uh, but it is on the roadmap for this year to be able to support all the VMs, all the different Windows types you would experience with this solution, to including multi-session. So once that becomes uh, something that's in production, it's really easy to synchronize all those apps into Intune from the Microsoft Store and just deploy out uninstalls for them. And that way, if someone goes back and tries to install it later, you've got some kind of mechanism in place to account for that configuration drift. So there's a couple of different ways you can handle it. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Hey, thank you uh, for your demonstration. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Sure, John, no problem. Okay, any more questions? It's a quiet group. I'm gonna start. I know some of these people, so if they don't start asking questions, I'm gonna start calling them out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. There'll be a short test afterwards, right? <laughs> yeah, this, uh, the one thing to keep in mind is I know the management of it looks kind of difficult. Um, it's by no means like any Microsoft product, set it and forget it. But a lot of times, once you get it working, it does just work pretty well. Uh, and the PowerShell commands, once you work in it a lot, is it's not bad. Uh, and again, there is a GUI that's coming soon that will make management of it a little bit easier. So just don't let that, don't let that deter you, right? It's a, 
a pretty easy to stand up solution if you have an immediate need for your your work from home users. Um, and there are other third party tools if you want to GUI immediately. Nerdio has one. I would believe that actually there's a Horizon, a Workspace One Horizon add on that kind of sits on top of Virtual Desktop that will manage it for you if you're really heavy into VMware or VMware Shop or Workspace One in general. So that could be an option for you. Just keep in mind there are added costs, licensing costs, those types of solutions. So there's many different ways you can deploy it. I just have I just have one comment, and that's that if you've ever tried to set up remote desktop or the old Microsoft remote app, this is worlds easier. <laughs> it may yep. not seem like it, but it's worlds easier than that. It's the next evolution of, of RDS, right? They're trying to get RDS to compete with the subjects of the world without all the extra licensing costs that comes along with something like that. So, and they've done a pretty good job. Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we can wrap it up for today. Thanks everyone for attending and don't forget to tell your, your less experienced members of your teams that uh, we're gonna do an introductory presentation next month. Uh, we'll teach them the whole Azure platform in an hour and a half, <laughs> well, which is probably impossible, but we'll give it a shot anyway. Hey, thanks for attending and we'll see you then. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bill, appreciate it. Thank you, Jerry.